Welcome back, everyone. Um, it's been a great morning so far, and I am really excited to resume the remainder of the webinar session here. Um, we are having a panel discussion with two presenters right here from UW-Madison, and Dr. Saldana and Dr. Ahrens will be our discussants. We'll first hear from, is Dr. Kwanbeck? Are you going first? I apologize, I thought. Are you going first, Dr. Kwanbeck? I'm happy to, I'm not sure. No, that but that wasn't the plan. Okay, we're gonna hear first <laughs> from Dr. Ford, um, who's an assistant professor in the School of Pharmacy here at UW-Madison. Um, and he is going to present about the development of the NIATEC stages of implementation checklist utilization in a randomized controlled trial of addiction treatment agencies. Um, and then we're going to hear from Dr. Kwanbeck, uh, who is an assistant professor in the Department of Family Medicine and Community Health, but an engineer by training, about um, applying a micro-costing approach to costing the implementation of the balanced opioid initiative. Um, so it's really a pleasure to hear from both of these speakers. Um, and if you'd like more information on their bios, you can find it on the Launchpad short course website. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to um, hand it over to Dr. Ford to start. Thank you so much for being here. Great. Thank you very much, Heidi. I am. Um... Hold on a second. <laughs> I'm doing my, getting my screen to share here. All right, there we go. Thank you very much. Uh, just like Dr. Kronbeck, we're both uh, engineers by training. So that you're getting an engineering perspective today. Um, I wanna talk to you about a different application of the, uh, the SIC in which we used it to develop a tool called the NIATEX uh, Stages of Implementation Completion to measure organizational competency to NIATEX as a part of a large randomized control trial. So as a, as a part of that, uh, just to give you kind of a brief overview of the objectives, I'm gonna briefly describe the study, talk a little bit about the development of the NIATEX SICK, uh, share with you some of the high level results from the study, and then really set the stage for um, a new study that we're doing uh, that's going to also be using the NIATEX uh, SICK and some of the uh, ongoing challenges that I think we'll have as we move forward with this new randomized control trial. So kind of in a nutshell, the, um, the DDCAT study randomized 49 uh, community addiction treatment programs in the state of Washington to either get the NIATEX strategy or a wait list control, and then they flipped uh, and at four different time points, they were assessed uh, using the DDCAT index that was developed by Dr. Mark McGovern. The exposure to the NIATEX uh, implementation strategies included primarily coaching, but they had some day-long uh, learning sessions and a couple of webinars as well, but they were really encouraged to, to work with their coach to implement change projects to try to improve their co-occurring capacity. So when Lisa and I uh, and our teams first started um, to sit down to figure out how we kind of adapt the SICK to the NIATEX implementation strategies, we had to address um, you know, quite a few complicated uh, questions. We had to try to figure out how do you measure the implementation process when the implementation is under a fixed time period, the, the actual implementation period was for a year versus kind of open-ended. Uh, implementation. You know, given that each of these organizations may implement a variable number of change projects and have varying levels of contact with their coach, how do we need, how do we account for that when we're trying to develop the SICK and to measure the proportion and duration of the events that are, are going on? And also kind of given that the NIATEX model uh, given it, you know, was it appropriate to kind of consider the start and end dates of all the different chain cycles as an activity in the implementation process, or just consider the start um, and end date of the various change projects, not the chain cycle. So we had to wrestle with some of these questions as we develop this, this instrument. But the biggest challenge that uh, took Lisa and I a while to figure out was how do we assess 
competency to the NIATEX implementation strategies. This is something that actually, unlike what Lisa was saying, ideally you'd figure all this out at the beginning. It took us several meetings um, for over the course of several months to figure out what were we actually going to use as a way to assess competency for the NIATEX implementation strategies. So Lisa showed you kind of the distribution of items in the universal SICK uh, earlier. You can see this, this is the distribution of the items that we had in the NIATEX uh, SICK. We had a few more uh, areas in the pre-implementation and had a lot of stuff in stage seven with the model fidelity and the staff competence because that's where we were tracking information about the change projects that people were engaged in, the number of coaching calls, the peer-to-peer -peer, uh, minutes. And then, as you can see at the bottom, competency really was uh, measured as a score of NIATEX fidelity. And, and that actually involved a create, using information from a separate tool that we developed as a part of this project. So just to talk about that uh, a little bit, you can see over here on the left-hand side of the screen, these are just kind of the different elements of the NIATEX SIC. And we actually took the book, the, there's a NIATEX book that really explains all of the key steps. You know, did you take time out to um, understand your customer? Did you focus on a key problem? Did you select the right change leader? Did you generate ideas from outside the field? Did you document what was going on inside of your change project? You know, how did you select your change team members and then was there kind of a sustainability plan and a business case for the different change projects? And we actually developed a, a second tool that was very similar. It was a five point kind of scale where we used actually qualitative, a qualitative approach to kind of look at documentation, listen to interviews um, and other available information from each of the agencies. And we actually rated them uh, on the degree to which they were adhering to the NIATEX model. How much were they doing that? And then we use those results to kind of dichotomize the organizations into being competent or not competent as it relates to NIATEX. These are just some of the key results that we, that we saw looking at kind of a, in a per protocol analysis. We found that there were large, moderate to large effect differences in the overall DDCAT score uh, from, comparing the NIATEX, the initial NIATEX group to the waitlist group. We found that, um, you know, things like comparing the sustainment phase of NIATEX to the implementation stage, those agencies that were competent showed greater improvements in NIATEX, DDCAT score, the program milieu, uh, continuity of care and staffing scores. And then when we actually looked at our last analysis of this, we saw that both groups, both the NIATEX group and the waitlist group had successful implementation and integration of services. And the change, irregardless of their competency level, was very similar from year to year. And the only place that we saw a difference uh, in the kind of adherence or the competency in NIATEX strategy, um, it really did not vary at that point when we got further out comparing baseline to year three. We also saw that agencies that had a high degree of adherence were more likely or less likely actually to uh, provide access to psychotropic medications, which is kind of unusual given that this was a co-occurring uh, study. And then there was really no difference in their use of substance use or both med medications, both substance use and mental health psychotropic meds. So that kind of moves us in a little bit uh, very quickly quick conversation about this new grant that Dr. McGovern and I have, which is going to be using an adaptive implementation strategy design. And essentially, agencies are going to get some monitoring and feedback about their ability to provide medications for opioid use disorders. Depending on how well they perform with that, they'll, they'll either continue or they'll get a NIATEX MAT Academy. Um, Again, depending on how well they do after that exposure, they'll either be randomized to get NIATEX external facilitation or internal facilitation. And then if they're still not doing well after the internal facilitation, they'll get exposed to the NIATEX uh, external facilitation arm. So we've got four different implementation strategies 
that are going on inside of this trial that we want to figure out how we're going to actually use the NIATEX um, SIC. And I know Lisa and her team are probably really looking forward to having this conversation with us as we are with them to try to figure this out. Um, this slide just kind of shows you an overview of the elements that are inside of each of these strategies. I'm not going to spend um, time going through them, but you can kind of see what's happening. It gets more complex uh, the further up you go in the process. And then there's this whole uh, idea of how are we going to know whether or not an agency needs to move from one intervention arm to another. And we're looking at three, three measures reach, adoption, and implementation. So they've got to have greater than 50% of their patients with an opioid use disorder or getting a medication for that opioid use disorder. They need to have an on-site uh, prescriber for opioid use disorder medications. And then they need to have an IMAT score greater than or equal to three. And it's those criteria that will dictate whether or not a clinic is actually moving you know, from say the Niatex Mad Academy, do they continue with that intervention or do they get randomized to either internal or external facilitation? So when we look at this study, I mean, you know, we talked a little bit about some of the questions that we had to answer in our original R01 and trying to figure out competency. Well, we're gonna have similar challenges to think about in this study because we not only wanna use a modified version of the NIATEX SIC, but we also want to figure out how to modify the coins that Lisa was talking about uh, in the earlier session to actually capture information about cost. So these are just some of the questions that we are probably gonna be wrestling with over the next several months as we're trying to figure out how to develop these tools for our upcoming, uh, the actual implementation of our upcoming R01. So how do we develop this instrument, um, you know, to measure the proportion of activities completed and the duration, you know, across each of the four implementation strategies? If you remember going back and looking at that table, what's involved in each strategy is very, very different. So we would expect that the NIATEX SIC for each implementation strategy would be very different, you know. How do we define and measure implementation strategy competency, you know, given the unique structure of each of the different implementation strategies? And then what impact does the exposure of the different implementation strategies have on the assessment of competency as well as measuring proportion and duration? And what do I mean by that? You know, an agency could, um, after they got their benchmark report and after they went through the academy, they could then get exposed to internal facilitation and then again, external facilitation. And each of those strategies is going to kind of have a different kind of NIATEX SIC associated with it. But how do you kind of add all of that together, put all those ingredients together as they've been exposed to these different uh, components to determine competency at the end of the day? Once they've been exposed to everything, how are we going to assess and measure competency? And then the last, and that's kind of leading into this last question is, you know, how do we address competency you know, if a clinic is exposed to one or more of the implementation strategies? The other thing that I didn't mention just real quickly is you can kind of see the X's, the red X's in this um, image. And basically it's possible for an agency who's doing well at a subsequent uh, assessment point to drop back into one of the other strategies. So now you've got a delay where they were out of it and now they're back into the study and how do you, how do you address that? So this is just some contact information. I know we'll have time for questions uh, later on. So just thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much, Jay. Now we're looking forward to hearing from Dr. Kwanbeck or Andrew. Can you share your screen, please? All right, does that look okay? Yes. Perfect. Okay. 
All right, well, thanks for the opportunity to present today. Um, I'm excited to share some information on uh, current implementation research that we're leading at UW-Madison. Um, and this is a project that has an explicit focus on costing implementation strategies. So really kind of relevant to the theme of our, our short course for this year. Um, I wanna first acknowledge um, funding that supported this line of research from the National Institute on Drug Abuse and offer special thanks to research team members, uh, Rose Garza Hennessy, Nick Schumacher and Morgan Burns who are uh, running the study that I'm going to be describing today. So let's set the stage. Um, why should you care about implement, uh, implementation costs? Um, so I'm the, the research that I'm gonna share was funded under program announcement 19274, Dissemination Implementation Research and Health from NIH. Um, which is sort of the main uh, funding avenue for DNI research in the United States and a lot of worldwide research as well. Um, so there's a lot of review criteria, but I wanted to pinpoint um, a few specific elements that are really worth paying attention to. Um, has consideration been given to the resource requirements and costs of the intervention? Are the measurements and analysis plan linked to the study aims and does the analysis incorporate the best available data to track dissemination or implementation process and impact including cost effectiveness with the emphasis on cost effectiveness? Um, how appropriate are the plans to sustain effective dissemination and implementation approaches once the research funding period has ended? So uh, if you're uh, going to apply to this program announcement, these are criteria that um, Pragmatically speaking, you want to know about because you'll be evaluated um, by, by reviewers on them. But there's an even, I think, more important consideration, um, which is the, the real world uh, importance of this question. How much will it cost to implement? Um, and this really gets, you know, kind of following on into one of the last uh, points about sustainability. Have you thought about plans for sustainability um, after the grant funding has ended? And if you're going to sustain, uh, say you've done a great project and people are interested in implementing your intervention, um, this question is definitely going to come up. Um, it's, it's one of those things that to maximize, or it's a question that to maximize the impact of your research, you really have to have an answer to. And it really applies across all sorts of settings because regardless if you're a, a healthcare organization, a, a school community-based organization, um, Virtually all organizations measure the cost of inputs in monetary terms. So you ultimately have to get to some kind of estimate of what is the cost to implement uh, your intervention. So the research I'm reporting here has been going on since 2014. Um, and it's focused on uh, opioid prescribing. Um, I'm not going to get into the whole issue of opioids. I think uh, most of us at this point have are aware of the issues around opioids in society. We're focused specifically on implementing a set of universal precautions for opioid prescribing in primary care settings. There are clinical guidelines for opioid prescribing, but their uptake has been, has been slow and, and difficult. Um, so we're really focused on implementing clinical guidelines. One of the important things that's uh, in the guidelines is that uh, there's evidence showing that the risk of overdose is directly correlated with the average morphine equivalent dose. So our, our primary outcome is, is trying to reduce the average morphine equivalent daily dose across uh, sites participating using an 18 month uh, adaptive implementation strategy. Um, I'm not gonna get into uh, AIM-2 in this presentation, but AIM-3 is definitely relevant because we're estimating the costs of delivering a different sequences of, and combinations of implementation strategies. And we're doing um, cost effectiveness analysis as part of our uh, as part of our study. So this is just a, a very quick overview of the study design. Um, we're, we're using an adaptive, a smart uh, trial design here, um, and the sequence and combination of strategies in the study design progresses from least to most intensive, uh, sort of drills to deeper and deeper levels of personalization. Um, over time. So the, the first strategy that we offer are educational meetings. This is uh, conceived as a system level strategy uh, in which a respected physician imparts information on the current state of the science on opioid prescribing. 
Um, uh, our system level strategy also includes performance feedback reports um, so that um, clinics can kind of know how they're doing on their opioid prescribing metrics. Um, we have a second stage randomization to practice facilitation, which is conceived as a clinic level strategy that targets clinic processes and, and workflows. So we're moving down from the system level to the clinic level. Um, and then a third stage of randomization uh, where we're delivering pres prescriber peer consulting, which is sort of a novel implementation strategy that's targeted at specific clinicians. Um, and, you know, we have we have faculty members uh, who have a lot of experience in opioid prescribing work directly with primary care physicians in the field to get to you know, discussion around challenging uh, patient issues. And, and uh, a lot of the focus is around tapering uh, patients um, to uh, lower doses of, of opioids. Um, so that's, that's a tricky thing to do and it takes a lot of uh, discussion and effort. So uh, it kind of ramps up in terms of cost and intensity as the study goes on. So I'm going to just briefly describe how we're costing our implementation strategies. Um, we first mapped the implementation strategies onto the ERIC taxonomy. That's hopefully familiar to, to many of you. Um, the reference is down below. And then we uh, cross-listed that with uh, Proctor et al.'s guidance for, for specifying implementation strategies. This provides a framework that facilitates uh, micro-costing, which is what we're doing. Um, we're focused, at least at this point, this research is ongoing, so we're focused on the pre-implementation and implementation stages, uh, according to SICK and COINS, and we want to use the decision-making perspective of a healthcare system. Um, so how much would it, because we're, this is a health system, uh, we have two health systems participating, uh, the idea at the end of this is a health system might want to replicate what we're doing, and we're trying to um, come up with replication costs, so if, if somebody wants to take up this uh, approach, they will have a, a playbook and a guide for doing it and know how much it's going to cost. So as suggested by uh, SICK and COINS, um, we, we look at the pre-implementation stage and we are uh, separating things into fixed and variable costs. This is not um, meant to be an exhaustive list by any means, uh, but just sort of illustrative of, of uh, some of the things to, to look at. Um, the way we've conceived that we don't have fixed costs in the pre-implementation stage, but variable costs um, really have to do with time, uh, you know, IT staff time to develop quality monitoring systems, consultant time to develop uh, educational content, and then to, uh, time to, to train our prescriber peer consultants. Um, fixed costs in the implementation stage, um, you know, we look at things like uh, we're delivering all of our uh, implementation strategies remotely, so we have to have uh, uh, subscriptions to WebEx is what we're using uh, primarily uh, in our environment to deliver uh, implementation meetings. Uh, but really the largest costs are variable costs in terms of time, um, clinic staff's time away from clinic duty, duties, scheduling events, presenters at educational meetings, facilitation, uh, et cetera. Um, this is quite typical of uh, implementation research in general, where uh, labor costs really do predominate. Um, that is certainly true of our study and is, is true of most implementation research studies that you'll see. I want to quickly demonstrate how we map the ERIC taxonomy and the Proctor frameworks um, using facilitation as, as an example. Um, so you'll see on, on the left column, uh, we've got the ERIC strategies. And then we lay out the actor actions, the target of the action, temporality, uh, dose, um, and targeted uh, implement, uh, implementation outcomes, and then sort of how that maps onto microcosting. So this framework it, it shares some similarities with with coins, um, and that it really lays out uh, a very sort of granular way of looking like who's doing what and when for how long. Ultimately, you know, the most important thing is to come up with estimates of how long it's taking actors, Im implementation agents to, uh, to execute the implementation strategy and then multiplying it out by uh, appropriate wage rates for each of those actors. So as far as data collection is concerned, um, you know, really it gets down to just really keeping track of time, um, contact logs, uh, a lot of the uh, 
contacts can be sort of passively monitored through calendars and uh, email uh, records and things like that. Um, time logs uh, really depends, is the responsibility of the implementers with a lot of prodding um, from the research team to make sure that uh, uh, they're keeping track of all their implementation activities. And so there's a bit of an investment. Uh, we estimated about four months, uh, four hours each month to, uh, to keep track of time costs for our study. So cost effectiveness is a very large topic that I can't really get into in any depth. Um, but as an engineer, I, I view cost effectiveness as really sort of an optimization problem um, and really all implementation research. Um, I, I view through an optimization kind of lens. And we want to help decision makers weigh the costs and effects of using different implementation strategies. You know, what, what kinds of returns are you going to get for the uh, the economic investment and in, in different implementation approaches. And ultimately, um, you know, there's different perspectives that can be taken, but as I mentioned earlier, we really want to use the perspective of organizational leaders to ultimately make the decisions about the adoption of evidence-based practices in organizations. Um, and then again, we're gonna be using incremental cost effectiveness ratios to uh, quantify the trade-off. Um, in terms of, uh, you know, reducing morphine equivalent dose is going to be our primary outcome. Um, so how much does it cost to, to reduce dose to, to what degree? Um, so I just wanted to close by pointing you to um, uh, some things that are coming down the pike here, other, other good uh, resources. Again, uh, this first one is, is Lisa's um, uh, the coins model kind of first on the scene here and provides a great example of how to apply coins. Um, a couple of uh, newer uh, applications by Garner et al. Um, kind of use this, this cross uh, sort of matrix, matrix representation of Eric with the implementation strategy uh, specification. Um, and that was published in 2018 and they did a full cost effectiveness analysis there. Uh, the Quanbeck article um, is just the protocol for the paper that I talked about today. And then uh, Sadaba and colleagues sort of generalized the approach um, uh, of how you can use time-driven activity-based costing, which is a micro-costing approach similar to what we're doing, to uh, estimate the cost of implementation strategies. Um, so I suggest checking out all of these resources for examples. Um, finally, things coming up down the pike, there's going to be a special issue on economic evaluation implementation science. Um, uh, some of the first articles are, are starting to be published now. Uh, you can read more about uh, the special issue at this link and keep an eye out on the implementation science site. I know that Lisa and I are both working on papers for this and, uh, and there'll be a good collection uh, on this topic coming up. Uh, and that's it. Here's, uh, if you want to read more about uh, research that we're doing, you can check out our lab website and uh, feel free to contact me by email with any questions. And I'll stop sharing. Thanks. Thank you so much, Dr. Kwanbeck. That was fabulous. And Dr. Ford as well. Um, I feel better knowing that you two smart people are tackling the, this, the opioid epidemic. Um, <clears throat> We are, we have Dr. Ahrens and Dr. Saldana as discussants, but we found yesterday that there were so many interesting questions from our participants that we wanted to encourage our participants to go ahead and place questions in the Q&A and we will raise them as our discussion, um, as our discussion progresses. And I see there are already a couple of questions already here. Dr. Saldana or Dr. Ahrens, do you have burning comments or should I go right to our audience um, questions? I'd be happy for you to go right to the audience questions. And then um, if we have time, I definitely have some thoughts and comments myself, but I'd love to hear from the audience. All right, excellent. Oh, same sorry. Here. I'm just gonna say same here. So let's, let's go with the participants. Excellent. Um, so the first question is, what are the key considerations for who does what in an implementation effort? How much do you consider expertise, profession, background of individuals, level of training and salaries? And how do you negotiate that with all the stakeholders that are or could be contributing the personnel to the project? 
this question is totally resonating with me, with me as I think about sustainability and who pays for what. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to offer a first thought and love to hear from Jay as well. Um, it's a great question and, and I think you do have to think carefully about it. Um, you know, for instance, in our, our study on opioid prescribing in primary care settings, we have this multi-level kind of implementation framework. And, you know, we learned, we, did, we had an R34 clinical trial planning grant that helped inform the R01 that we're currently running. One of the things that we, you know, sort of learned and was or hypothesized and was really confirmed in the pilot stage is that you need physicians to be involved, um, actively involved in efforts to change practices around opioid prescribing in primary care settings. Um, and if you go back to the to the source literature on this topic, uh, I think of Roger's diffusion of innovations and the concept of homophily, which is uh, refers to the degree of similarity between change agents and the the persons that they're trying to influence. So you could think of that as like the actor and the action target. So we didn't think it would make, and we're getting to a, an issue like, all right, I have a patient you know, who's co-prescribed benzodiazepines and, you know, has uh, troubling urine drug results. That's a, that's an issue that only a physician can advise another physician on, uh, which doesn't have very significant cost consequences. And it's sort of why we're saving it for the last stage. Um, because, you know, we're looking to see what kind of an effect we can have with, with more distance-based um, and less costly approaches to implementation. So the, the facilitators um, are not MDs. They're working with more of the clinic staff. Um, you know, most of them have sort of master's level training and a lot of experience with uh, workflow management and organizational change. Um, so it really depends on the, the type, the sort of target of the action using the Proctor framework um, and, you know, making sure that you're matching change agent with the, with the action target, I think is the important consideration from my perspective. What are your thoughts today? Yeah, I, I would agree with um, a lot of what you said there, Andy. I think one of the other things that um, thinking back to when we first got involved in working with behavioral health organizations, you know, oftentimes the people that were involved in the implementation effort were those people who were, um, you know, driving the process. So for example, you know, if you were trying to figure out how to implement changes to reduce wait time or reduce no-shows, you know, you might have been in, you might have engaged, uh, you know, staff that were the, the first people that the client saw coming into the organization. Um, you know, you might involve the, the billing people, you might involve the office manager, as well as some counselors, you know, to be the ones that were kind of being the implementation agents for that change in the organization. And so, you know, the skill levels or the mix or the salaries that were associated with those folks, you know, would be very different than say, if you're implementing, you know, an evidence-based practice like seeking safety, because there may be very different people um, that are coming into the mix. My experience has been, is that you, you know, you've really got to you know, engage the people, you've got to get them to get the buy-in uh, understand the importance of addressing this issue from the perspective of their customers um, and, and really working together as a team to do that. And yes, cost, salary associated with these individuals is going to help determine whether it's cost effective. Um, but I really think it's getting the people engaged, getting the process in, uh, integrated into the culture of the organization that's really going to drive success. Um, and then cost is just a another piece of the puzzle. Heidi, might I add something just real quickly to that? Absolutely. I think, I think that both what Jay and, and, and Andrea have said, I absolutely agree with you guys. I think one key consideration for this particular question, depending on the practice or the in, an innovation that's being implemented, you also want to think about reimbursement. And so um, there are some parts of implementation strategies that if conducted by one personnel versus another personnel, it's gonna reimburse at a different rate. 
And so although something might seem like, oh, it's more efficient for us to, to give it to this individual who makes less money FTE wise, the reimbursement um, will offset that and possibly even, um, you know, save you downstream. So I think you want to take those things into consideration as well. Yeah, and I'd, I'd like to just build on that. Those are great points. And the reimbursement and funding is really related also to what specific practices can be supported. So when you think about Medicaid funding, for example, which many of our clients in addiction services are funded under Medicaid, uh, if you take interventions, just take consent, contingency management, for example, you know, we know that effective contingency management requires sort of a steady, steady stream of reinforcement. Um, however, Medicaid, I think, provides uh, $65 per year um, for, for that kind of intervention, which we know is, is not what is really needed. So there's this fit of not only kind of the implementation process, but what you're implementing and how well that can be sustained in the system based on existing funding streams. So we're always thinking about how our implementation strategy and the intervention being implemented fit within existing funding streams. And if it requires more beyond that, who can be engaged at policy or organization level to help support or explore those increased costs that might be needed to sustain uh, a practice once it's implemented. There's a question in the Q&A about differentiating new costs of hiring staff versus operationalizing, implementing strategies using existing personnel. Um, and I'm thinking also about Jay's comment about how often the people who start the process are already engaged and so might cost less than the people in whom you're building capacity to implement over time. Are there ways in which we can account for those costs or how do we think about those things? Jay and Andrew, did either one of you do that in your in your studies? I wasn't. I'm not sure if they were new hires or if they were just assign um, assignments of old hires. Typically, it was you know individuals who are already in the organization, um, you know who were um, appointed as maybe a change leader, or appointed to a change team to participate in the process. Um, you know, I. I, I haven't experienced, you know, necessarily with the, with the exception of dealing with like staff turnover, you know, where there may be a new person being promoted into um, the process. Um, I have seen in studies that I've been doing across multiple settings that oftentimes that change in key individuals in the implementation process, you know, do have a potential to kind of derail the whole um the whole process. I, I think when we were doing the DDCAT study in the state of Washington, you know, some of the agencies that probably dropped out if we really asked them and never achieved competency were ones where they had just too much staff turnover um, and just never could get things going again. Um, but I don't know, Andy, do you have thoughts about like new, call, new uh, hires versus existing staff? Yeah, it's... That's definitely a tricky one. Um, I think that in a sense, it's sort of integral to the way that you've specified your implementation strategy. Now we, um, either way, when, when we cost out our strategy, we are trying to value the opportunity cost of the time spent by clinic staff. Um, on implementation activities. So whether it's whether it's sort of the responsibility of clinic staff who are doing the implementation versus someone who's hired to do implementation from the research team, I think it does, you do need to account for that, but you know, you might have an implementation strategy that that's really dependent on hiring a facilitator and, and virtually all the costs are associated with the facilitation costs, in which case you know, I think there's going to be sort of a balance, uh, and I don't think there's a hard and fast answer other than uh, those costs are real and they shouldn't 
shouldn't be kind of swept under the rug and that, you know, economics would we use op- the concept of opportunity costs as a way of making sure that we don't ignore things that are actually relevant to, to somebody. Yeah, and I think those points, again, are really great when you're thinking about it from the defining your, um, your implementation process perspective. I think um, for this particular question, I always like to encourage folks to, um, for a lot of roles, not just, not just have a, a warm seat in the chair, you know, a warm body in the chair. And so um, I, what I see happen a lot of times when we're bringing in new um, implementations or new innovations, especially if it's an agency that's de-adopting one thing and then replacing a new thing, that there's a tendency to want to just use that existing staff for that um, implementation. And while sometimes that is absolutely an efficient and okay thing to do, um, other times it's not. And so I think before making those decisions, I would just encourage anybody to do a real thorough assessment of the needs. And again, this goes back to what we were talking about in terms of the function, the function of the strategy and how can we serve and get that function accomplished with those particular individuals. Um, And it just depends on the implementation and on the intervention. Yeah, this is such a simple question with so many (laughs) important uh, nuances to it. I I love it. you know, the, the idea of thinking about, you know, workflows of all the people involved, whether you're, you know, I know, Andrew, you mentioned, you know, organization leaders, but there are many levels and who's going to be implicated, what do they have to give up in order to participate in this implementation, or can the work that you're doing really be integrated are, are critical questions. And then this idea of, you know, can we turn over proof uh, implementation and sustainment, right? It's it's something that is an issue in the field. Um, so how do we create the processes and supports so that once our project ends, uh, if a pra- if a practice is being sustained, how is turnover accounted for? And we've wrestled and struggled with that. I wonder, both um, Andrew and Jay, how you've sort of thought about that. Um. That's a good question, Greg. I think one of the challenges with the turnover is to, as you're going about developing your processes that you want to to integrate, is how do you put that into the fabric of the organization? How do you kind of institutionalize the changes that you've made? Because if you've done it well, you know, then I think what should be able to happen, you know, is a new person should be able to come in, should be able to spend a little bit of time studying the process, um, you know, understand how they're supposed to implement it. And then basically just pick the ball up and, and run, you know, run towards the, you know, the goal line of keeping things going at, you know, over time. That doesn't happen very well. I don't think in a, in a void where leadership is not really supportive of the change. Um, You know, it's very interesting. Some work I did around in the, in the VA, years ago, you know, talks about uh, or found out that, you know, leaders in an organization may have a very different perspective about uh, sustainment than the actual individual employees who are boots on the ground doing the work. So I think it has to be that your processes are integrated into the fabric of the organization. And then leadership has to be able to support that going forward. Um, And I think if those things happen, maybe turnover can survive. But I agree with you. It's a complex issue that I don't think we have all the answers to yet. Yeah, Greg, I'm, I, uh, you mentioned the chaos. You have 20 chaos factors. Um, is turnover one of them? Because I would love to understand how you're dealing with it. It's certainly, you know, I think it's something that every project has to deal with, and we're certainly dealing with it to a large degree. You know, we've had uh, massive turnover, especially among medical assistants in uh, the health system, one of the health systems that we're working with, and exactly how we're going to account for that, I think, is a bit of an open question at this point. Yeah, so uh, just briefly, you know, we've, as I mentioned yesterday, we've identified those different chaos scenarios. Many of them have to do with turnover or movement of people within an organization during an implementation process. And 
and we've come up with sort of rules for how we deal with each. And then again, developing covariates we can put into analytic models. But it's, um, yeah, we've also been thinking about, you know, what interventions, what evidence-based approaches might be more robust uh, in the face of leader turnover, staff turnover, and those sorts of things. And that's where we're very excited about a couple projects we're working on that are implementing different technologies um, to support quality of care. So you're, you're prompting me to really work on that paper and, and get it out there. <laughs> so thanks. I think we can go back to the questions now. Because there are um, a lot. There are two votes for, have there been replication studies to see how closely implementation cost estimates in one context transfer to other contexts? And if so, what have we learned? Are estimated costs generally accurate or much more variable than predicted? And then there's also a request from somebody else for um, any examples outside of healthcare. So perhaps if, if there are replication studies looking at implementation costs um, in other fields as well, that would be helpful. Um, <clears throat> I can take a crack at the replication question um, because I've been sort of, I'm working on a paper where we've looked at this and I think the short answer is no. Uh, the, the the level of evidence around implementation strategy costing um, is is developing at this point. So systematic reviews have not come up with. I mean, usually they conclude poor and variable quality of implementation strategy costing uh, in a nutshell. I think there does need to be more attention to this in the paper that I'm working on. We have a section on special section on replication costs because I think we know that they are going to vary on all sorts of dimensions, you know, different organizational types, context, organizational size, uh, location, you know, it's going to cost, uh, you know, different cost profiles in San Francisco versus Madison, um, the, the kind of fidelity and adaptation to uh, the protocol that uh, that happens is going to affect costs. So um, that's, I think, a very rich topic uh, that we know uh, is important and understudied at this point. And I think it's a great, it's a great question. Not a lot of research uh, out there, although a lot of anecdotal kind of, you know, experience from researchers in the field saying like, yeah, it varies a lot. Yeah, I'm like like Andy. I'm not aware of a lot that's going on in the private sector. I suspect what why we may not see a lot with implementation frameworks is that these organizations already have their own, you know, frameworks and approaches to uh, quality. You know, so they're using total quality management. They're using something else, and so they're studying it from that perspective. They're not thinking about you know the application of you know, the EPIS framework or the re-AIM framework in their work, um, you know, in the private sector. So I suspect that's a lot of why we're not seeing uh, too much of that translation. Yeah, uh, and, you know, private sector, in the private sector, there's not sort of the same motivation to do research and publish results as well, which I think right. is relevant. And I was just going to say, in terms of the replication, we have for different evidence-based practices, so it's not that we have a standardized sort of recommendation for what costs would be broadly across, you know, any implementation, but per evidence-based practice or per, per, even if it's not an EBP, per practice, let's just say, um, we absolutely have done that for, for groups and where they um, where we've been able to analyze a large enough number of implementations for that particular practice to come up and to identify consistency and the costs of those different implementation strategies that they're using along the SIC continuum. And then those folks have been using that in some ways just to create marketing materials so that they know like, um, usually they have materials for this is the cost of the intervention, but now slowly but surely they're able to start developing materials for this is going to be the cost of the associated implementation. And so combined, the customer would then have a good sense of what the total cost would be to, um, to adopt that program. Yeah, and I did want to mention, I mean, there's some relevant work occurring in 
in private industry. Um, and I put in the chat a study by Dov Zohar looking at improving safety climate uh, and the implementation strategy. It was just a discourse based um, strategy where they provided for for the group randomized to the strategy, they assess the degree to which leaders or team leaders talked about safety. They fed that information back to those leaders. And that was the whole intervention. And that simple intervention improved uh, the rate at which they the leaders talked about safety. Uh, it led to improvements in safety climate and safety outcomes. Uh, so, that's a really nice example of, of a study in, um, in industry. And it's, I think, important to note that, you know, the seminal work by Catherine Klein and colleagues on implementation climate and management support published in 2001, I'll put that in the chat as well. You know, they, that really thought about implementation strategies and implementation approaches for improving implementation climate, leading to uh, effective implementation in manufacturing settings. So we, we have a, a rich history. Uh, I know, Andy, you mentioned um, the work by Ev Rogers in Diffusion of Innovation that comes out of agriculture. So there, there's a, a really rich history of uh, cross-fertilization, no pun intended, um, with <laughs> with these other or other domains where we can really, I think, learn from uh, and advance the work we're doing in implementation. I'm wondering, sure. Heidi, if we can talk about that first question, the first question about measuring implementation. Yeah, okay, go ahead. Do you wanna do that? That was exactly what I was gonna say. It was there are, a, there are a couple votes for a question about, can you measure cost effectiveness in an implementation trial? Um, in an implementation effectiveness hybrid study, would you use the same cost analysis methods for the implementation and effectiveness components? Um, and then there's a related question from Dr. Ramley about the distinction between costs of delivering the intervention, executing implementation strategies, and costs associated with building implementation support systems. So those both seem sort of related. Yeah, and I can. I can speak to the first one, um, and it's it's a good question. And I, uh, I the way that I think about it, so cost effectiveness analysis. I think the the answer is yes, you can do cost effectiveness analysis in an implementation trial. Now the thing, uh, there has been over time a, a sort of codification of gold standards for cost effectiveness analysis, which involve uh, you know, measuring things using quality adjusted life years. It, it implies a patient level randomized trial effectiveness study. Um, however, cost effectiveness in its, in its very basic sense, you know, really goes all the way back to its roots in engineering is just about how much do you pay for a trade-off of any outcome? So if, if you're talking about gold standard, uh, you know, consulting the the guidebooks on cost effectiveness, cost effectiveness analysis and health and medicine, you'd say, well, no, it's not appropriate to measure. I don't think it's really appropriate to measure quality adjusted life years in an implementation trial. But health systems, um, you know, for instance, are under under significant pressure to uh, to reduce opioid uh, prescribing rates below ninety morphine equivalent per individual, and so. Uh, changing that metric, you know, effectiveness is, is a very broad term. Cost is always dollars. Effectiveness can be any outcome. Um, so uh, the short answer is yes, you can do cost effectiveness analysis in terms of trading off the, the return on investment in terms of the outcome that you're trying to target. Now, it's not, it's not going to be in all cases expressed in quality adjusted life years, which is useful for policymakers in that that provides sort of a, a measuring rod that they can compare different interventions. You know, does it, you know, a common metric, um, but implementation research, you know, is a little bit is, it's looking at it from a bit of a different perspective. I guess in terms of the hybrid, uh, so a study that I, we're running another study 
that is a type one hybrid with patient level randomization. Um, the one I talked about today is a type three with cluster randomization. Uh, the costing methods are different. Um, you know, we're, we're focused a lot more on intervention costs versus implementation strategy costs in a type one hybrid. And we actually are doing uh, sort of standard cost effectiveness analysis with quality adjusted life years as our primary um, metric. So hopefully that kind of uh, speaks to, the, uh, to that first question. And I'll turn it over to someone else to, to tackle the second one or, or to add on to that, to that response. Um, you know, Andy, I agree with what you had to say about, you know, the, the whole cost effectiveness and, you know, and the challenges there to kind of address the question that I think um, Edmund is raising is, is I think there's a couple ways to look at it. When you're looking at the implementation you know, of the intervention, you know, there might be individuals that are involved. So you might have a unit clerk, you might have a nurse, um, you know, you might have a, an LPN who are involved in implementing the particular um, intervention. And you probably want to get a sense of how much time, you know, are they spending associated with implementing that intervention. And their time can probably be both direct and indirect. So, you know, if they're delivering something to a patient, you know, you probably want to capture that time as kind of direct cost associated with delivering that. On the flip side, they may be spending some time in meetings discussing how they want to implement the intervention. And that may also be something, you know, that you want to capture. You know, if they're being guided by a coach or an external facilitator, you know, you have to kind of make a decision as to whether or not I think you want to include that cost. When we were doing the NIATEX 200 study, um, you know, we did include the cost of the coach, you know, so when they were going for a site visit, how much time were they spending, you know, with the organization, um, you know, if they were delivering content at a learning session, we captured that time for them. The, the issue of the technology and developing something, um, you know, for the study, you know, my inclination, would probably be that that would be something you would exclude and Andy may disagree with me because it's something that's going to be applied universally, you know, in the system for multiple people to use. And if you're realistically going to do it, it takes me back to the days of thinking about Medicare cost reports where you had a cost of the facility services and it was spread across the organization or to the different cost centers based on like how much, uh, square footage they took up in the building. And I think if you're going to do that with building a best practice alert, for example, you'd have to distribute that cost based on some metric. And then you've got the whole argument of, well, why did you choose this metric versus another one? So I don't know, Andy, if you think I'm off base with that last comment about the implementation strategy or not. No, I, I agree. And I would just say that I think that that's exactly right. And then, but keeping in mind that there are those pre-implementation costs, right? So sometimes our pre-implementation costs are one-time costs. Um, sometimes they are uh, sunk costs um, and, and costs that we forget about, but they are very real costs to whoever it is that's bringing in that new innovation. And so if they have to do the programming, bring in the new technology, absolutely, it's not an ongoing implementation cost but there's still those startup costs and we need to make sure that they can do that with quality for the rest of the implementation. Yeah, it might get to the, the concept of replication um, mm -hmm. because you, know, you don't need to develop, uh, redevelop everything from scratch, but there might, and it, it's gonna vary by project to what extent you have to consider like, well, what needs to go into the startup phase that that does need to be, that you can't skip basically. And I think you want to include things that are required for replication with fidelity. We have a really interesting um, follow-up question from Dr. Ramley about whether the outcomes of a cost-effectiveness analysis could be things like reach or adoption as opposed to effectiveness outcomes. Um, but we only have one minute left. Does anybody have a, a quick answer to share? Yes. <laughs> I, I agree. Yes. Goes along with the previous point. I mean, if you're going to be uh, 
cost effectiveness is a broad concept, and I think you can put any outcome into the you can put any outcome into the um, uh, denominator uh, of your choosing, whatever's relevant. And I'll say that we have a manuscript under review right now where we um, are showing just that. And so if if that, I'm not sure if it'll be accepted, but if it is accepted, that should be out in a couple of months. And what we do is we go through some examples of how you could use traditional cost effectiveness methods, but with implementation outcomes as your as your denominator. That's very helpful. This has been a really engaging and interesting session. At this point, we have a 15 minute break and the next portion of the afternoon, which is the interactive portion, and I encourage you all not to go away, to stay and apply what we've discussed this morning, including doing some hands-on tools um, to apply sick and coins. Um, the, that is going to be a Zoom meeting link instead of the Zoom webinar. So we're actually gonna go ahead and close this webinar during the 15 minute break. And we invite you and encourage you to join the day two meeting link that Rachel has placed into the chat starting at 145. Thank you very much um, to Andrew, Jay, Greg, and Lisa for this session. It's been really, really interesting. Thank you. All right. Thanks.